Hello, my name's Ben Wilson. I'm the ACCA's expert tutor for the AAA paper. Now, in this session, I'm going to be giving you lots of tips on how to score more marks in an audit procedures question. And procedures are so important for you to be good at because it's such a big part of the exam. It always features in section A in the case study question. You're often asked to design audit procedures for up to eight marks. And then in section B of the exam, we often see procedures featuring as well. You might be given some audit procedures that the audit team has done already and asked to critically evaluate them. So audit procedures really important through the whole exam. So it's a key topic for you to be all over. Now, the reason the ACCA are working with me as their expert tutor for this session is because I've got a wealth of relevant experience. I've worked as an auditor. So I spent four or five years at KPMG doing this stuff in practice. I've also been an audit examiner at the ICAW. So I know how audit exam questions are written and designed because I've done it. And I've been teaching this stuff for the last 15 years or so. And I now work at an organization called FME Learn Online, where I provide personal tutoring for students to give them the best chance of passing the AAA paper. So listen up. This session is going to be really, really useful for you. And you're in very safe hands with me to take you through the content. Here's our agenda for the session. We're going to start with a bit of a recap, a bit of background on audit procedures to make sure you know some relevant information. Then I'm going to tell you a few common issues from my experience of coaching students and the time that I get to spend with the examiner as well to tell you the common things that students do wrong in some of these questions. And then I'm going to give you my top tips on how to avoid those issues in your answers and make sure you score more marks. Then we're gonna have a demonstration where I show you the best approach to an audit procedures question using an, an example question. So starting with the topic recap, first of all, you might recognize this guy. If you live in the UK, you definitely know who Boris Johnson is. And if you're not in the UK, well, perhaps you've heard of him. He was the UK Prime Minister for several years and, uh, well, he stood down and was then investigated by Parliament because he broke the lockdown rules by hosting parties in Downing Street when we were supposed to be locking down to avoid COVID spreading. Now, the reason I'm talking about Boris Johnson is he's a lovely example for talking about audit evidence. Now, for audit evidence to be truly useful, it has to tick three boxes, right? The first bit, first box it has to tick is there has to be enough of it, right? It has to be sufficient. So talking about Boris Johnson, when he was being investigated by Parliament uh, over whether, uh, whether parties went on in Downing Street and whether the rules were broken and whether he knew about it, there was lots of evidence given from many different people, many different sources. Lots of people were interviewed and they got lots of documentary evidence, like things like emails and access to WhatsApp conversations as well. So there was sufficient evidence for that inquiry to do its job. Was that information fully relevant though? Well, Boris tried hard to stop the investigating committee having access to his WhatsApp messages uh, because he argued that wasn't relevant because there was non-government business discussed over WhatsApp. But the, uh, the committee overruled and did get access to those WhatsApp messages because they argued they were highly relevant and I would agree with them as well. This one though, reliable. Now, Boris gave evidence directly to the committee. He was interviewed. And the finding of the committee was that he lied through his teeth. Yeah. Is his evidence reliable? No. And that's what the committee found, that the evidence he gave was completely unreliable. They found him to be a liar and therefore he did break the rules around COVID lockdown parties. Right, let's bring this to the exam then. So good audit procedures. When you are writing a good audit procedure in the exam, it has to start with a fact from the scenario something you are trying to verify. And you have to refer to the audit evidence you are going to suggest. Ideally, it's third party evidence because that's more reliable. 
If we think back to Boris, just relying on what he tells us when he's biased because he's trying to get off from the charges, well, it's not reliable evidence. We have to get third party evidence. And that is the same in an audit procedures question. You can't just trust management. And critically, you have to give enough detail in your answer. The verb in an audit procedures question is usually describe, which means you have to set out in detail how the test works. So here we've got a decent audit procedure showing on screen. Pause the recording here and have a read of it. Now I'm going to pick out the three key parts of this audit procedure, the three things an audit procedure has to do. The first of them is a fact. And the fact here from the scenario is this 50 million that's been paid out. We don't know what it's for. It doesn't matter for the purposes of this exercise. Then the next thing was evidence, wasn't it? Ideally third party. And the third party evidence here is the bank statements. Then an explanation of the test, how it works, why we're doing it. Well, I'm referring to the confirming the accuracy of the amount of 50 million and the date it was paid to confirm the cutoff. Right, that's an excellent audit procedure because it ticks all three boxes and therefore is likely to score a full mark. Now, second item on our agenda, three common issues that students often have in audit procedures questions. The first one is students rely too heavily on a very weak source of audit evidence. Yeah, students often say, just ask Boris whether he lied or not. And Boris, of course, says, no, I didn't lie. If you say, discuss this matter with management for, well, and often students actually do this for several audit tests in the same answer, um, it will not score you any marks. It very rarely score marks, scores marks because management, just like Boris, are inherently biased. They will tell the auditor what the auditor wants to hear to back up the number that management have created. Now, just asking them whether the number they prepared is correct is not robust audit evidence. Okay? We've always got to be looking to suggest third party evidence wherever we can. Second issue, students love to rote learn past exam answers and rote learn lots from the textbook and it just doesn't work in AAA. If you write down standard audit procedures that would work for any balance, no matter what it is, it won't score. So the typical thing that students write is something like cast it, you know, cast the schedule or add it up. That is so boring and so standard. And the reason it doesn't score in AAA is because the requirement will ask you for the principal audit procedures, the main audit procedures. And that means anything kind of background, low level, uh, standard will not score. Now, if you're writing an audit procedure that you have pre-learned from the notes, it's very, very unlikely to score. Instead, you have to suggest high value tests. And we'll be going through what I mean by high value and how you come up with a high value test when we go through my top tip shortly. Third issue. And this happens so often with the students on my course when I take their work in for marking and give them detailed feedback. They only score half a mark for their audit procedures. It happens all the time when students are preparing on my course and it happens in the real exam. I know that because the examiner says it in their examiner's report. So why do they only score half a mark? Well, the answer doesn't have enough detail in it for it to score a full mark. Because audit procedures are always one mark per well-explained procedure. But you have to fully explain your procedure for it to score that full mark. So to fully explain it, you have to explain how the test works and why the auditor should do it. Otherwise, you're only going to score half of the mark that you could have scored. Right, my top tips then for audit procedures success. The first of these is you have to really dig deep in the scenario, right? They are telling you everything in that scenario for a reason. So I make sure that I try to use everything that they give me, any dates, any facts, 
because each of those is something that I can verify and therefore turn into an audit procedure that's going to earn me a mark. My second tip, I do not do anything that is a standard test, right? I don't buy off the suit, off the peg suits. I get my suits tailored. Well, I don't really, I can't afford it. But actually, who needs suits in this modern world of working from home all the time? But I want you to imagine that you are a fancy tailor in the exam, right? You are not just creating a bog standard size suit, you're creating a perfectly fitted jacket. So your tests, your audit tests have to be bespoke and tailored to the scenario. They are not off the shelf standard tests. And the way that we do that is by starting each of our audit tests with a bespoke fact from the scenario that we then think of a way of verifying using relevant third party information. My third tip, well, this is how you turn your half mark into a full mark. You must explain each test fully, right? If you've only written six words for an audit test, it is not going to be enough for it to score a full mark. So tips for you. You must set out how the test works with a bit of detail. Um, and as I referred to in my the previous slide in the common issues, explaining how the test works and why you're doing it. And something I try to do if it's relevant, is I refer to the financial statement assertions. Things like completeness or accuracy or recurrence or valuation. Now, I don't do that for every audit test because it's not always relevant. But if it is relevant, for example, around the accuracy of a number, then I will write it because that helps to encourage the marker to give me a full mark. On to the good stuff, the bit you've been really waiting for, a demonstration of technique. So what we've got showing on screen here is a scenario for an audit procedures question. And it is six marks, you can see that down the bottom here. So we're gonna need six audit procedures. So I'd like you to pause the recording here and read through the scenario first of all, please. Right, now you've had a chance to read through the scenario. On this side of the screen, we're gonna come up with an answer plan. Now, the first paragraph here is background, but some of this is going to be very, very relevant. It tells us the date today and the year end date of the audit. So I know that I'm a few months after year end. And so it makes sense that the audit testing is almost complete. I'm at the completion phase of the audit. Now, when I go into this second paragraph, I'm told a specific fact. The 1st of April X5. That is the date that these people were notified that they're going to be made redundant. Now, why is that relevant to the provision? Well, we provide for something if it meets a three stage test, don't we? You know your financial reporting, don't you? Three stage test for recognizing a provision. We have to have a present obligation as a result of a past event that can be reliably measured. So is there a present obligation as a result of a past event here? Well, the past event is the date, right? These people were notified before year end. So that does mean that there's a present obligation as a result of a past event, if this date is correct, but it might not be. They might have been notified after year end, in which case we shouldn't have a provision. So my audit test is to verify that date. And how am I gonna verify it? Well, I'm going to look at the redundancy notices that were sent to these people, and I'm gonna make sure that that date really is before year end, because if it isn't, we wouldn't need a provision. Right, my next fact, there are 75 members of staff. Is that a full complete list though? Or could some people be missing? Because if they're missing, then that 14 million might not be correct. So how would I know if that is a complete list? Where would this dis be, have been discussed um, that I could go and refer to to see if perhaps more people are going to be made redundant? Who would be discussing this that would know about it? Yeah, you've got it. It's the board, isn't it? Right, so I can go and look at the board minutes and make sure that there really are 75 people who are going to be made redundant. That's what the board have discussed. And I want to make sure that the board have authorised this, um, this redundancy programme. Because if it's not authorised, it might not happen. 
So by going to the board minutes and making sure that this is a complete list of the 75 staff, I'm able to work out whether the provision looks like it covers everyone and it isn't understated. Right, what else am I doing? Oh God, in this paragraph, there's another relevant fact. The 1st of August, X5. They're going to be made redundant in the future, right? That's in the future from now. So it hasn't yet happened. So what I really want to make sure is management are still committed to doing this. Yeah, they might have notified staff that they're going to be made redundant, but maybe they're not committed by that notification. They could change their mind. So how would I know whether they haven't changed their mind? Who's the only group who are going to know if management haven't changed their mind? Yeah, it's management themselves. And so where that is the case, um, and it's only management who know something, it's a valid source of evidence to obtain written management representations. Now, if there is someone else who would know the right answer here, someone other than management, someone third party, then I would put that third party information. But there isn't anyone else because it's only management that would know this. So I, that is a very valid source of information. So I want to get written management representations that they are going to go ahead with this redundancy program as planned because they could change their mind. That's what I'm getting at here. And if they change their mind, we wouldn't need the provision. Right. This next paragraph, any specific facts in here? Ooh, 10 percent. Ooh, 100 percent. Yeah, those are definitely relevant facts, aren't they? Because this that's going to those are key inputs into the size of the provision, that 14 million. So how would I verify that each member of staff has been told that, yes, it is going to be 10% of your salary for each year. And yes, the maximum is 100%. Where would I go for that? Well, it's going to be in this redundancy notification, isn't it? So in that individual letter that's sent to staff, I'm going to make sure that the input terms are fully accurate. And this is the size of the provision. It's not just a percentage. It has to be multiplied by a figure. That figure is their salary and their length of service. So the salary and length of service, I'm going to agree to the company's HR records to make sure that the inputs into the calculation are correct. And then finally, I'm told that the provision down here is $14 million. Now, there's going to have been quite a complicated calculation that's gone into this. Yeah, the salary for each year, the number of years for each member of staff times 10% with a limit of 100%. So where there's some complexity, they could have made a mistake, couldn't they? So I'm going to recalculate that figure based on my inputs here to make sure that it's accurate. Okay, it was six marks, one, two, three, four, five, six audit tests. I've got enough here. But even if I didn't have quite enough, if I only had four or five, I would move on at this stage because what you don't want to do is write one or two extra tests at the end that aren't very good and aren't principal procedures because, um, well, it would waste your time. That's the main reason. But also in this era of professional skills marks, we have to make sure we answer the specific question that's been set, the principal audit procedures. So if you write ones that aren't principal, you will lose professional skills marks as a result. So it's very important that you don't just add a couple of rubbish ones at the end just to get you up to six marks. Right. Here's that answer plan showing on screen. And what we're going to do now is turn it into a full written answer over on this side of the screen. So here's my answer using this answer plan. So my first point was about verifying the date that the people were notified they're going to be made redundant to make sure it's before year end, because that makes it a present obligation as a result of a past event and therefore a provision is required. So here's what I wrote. Obtain the redundancy notice sent to staff. Ensure the announcement was made on the 1st of April before year end, supporting there is a past event at the year end date and therefore requiring a provision to be recognised. See how I've added extra detail on here at the end to make sure I'm explaining why I'm doing the test, trying to turn it from half a mark into a full mark. My second point. Here I'm making sure that there are really 75 staff that are being made redundant to the board minutes as my source of evidence, making sure it's been authorised and that will give me some comfort over the size of the programme and that all staff that are going to be made redundant are included in this provision. 
So I'm confirming that all 75 members of staff are to be made redundant and that the programme's not bigger than this by agreeing to the board minutes. And I'll make sure it's been appropriately authorised because without authorisation, it might not go ahead and the provision wouldn't be needed. Again, I'm trying to explain fully why I'm doing this test. Next one was around, because um, this ha event hasn't happened yet at the date of the audit, I'm going to make sure management is still committed to the programme by obtaining written management representations. And so obtain those representations, written representations, that the programme will go ahead as planned on the 1st of August, because if management aren't committed to the programme, the provision wouldn't be needed. Excellent. Right, now on to verifying these terms, the 10% and the 100%, which I'm going to agree to the letters that were sent out to staff to confirm that they're accurate. So I've obtained those individual letters that are sent to staff, confirming the key payout details of 10% per year and 100% maximum. And look, I'm referring to the financial statement assertion, accuracy. And I'm explaining why I'm doing it, because these are key inputs into the calculation of the provision. Right, the next one, the salary and the length of service. I want to agree those to HR records to make sure that those key inputs are accurate. Again, look, I'm referring to the financial statement assertion. Excellent work, Ben. Well done, you. <laughs> right, the last one. And we're going to then recalculate the size of the provision to confirm the accuracy of the 14 million figure. Um, I could add a bit more detail onto here to explain myself a bit further um, that management could have made an error in this calculation because it's quite complicated. But with recalculate, this is a bit of inside knowledge for you, recalculate is generally only worth half a mark, even if it is a relevant procedure. And so there's not a great deal of point of in adding loads of detail onto recalculate because it'll only score you half a mark anyway. Right, that's us done. Thanks for your attention and I hope you found this session useful.